In 1978, Toei entered into a partnership with Marvel Comics and Marvel Entertainment to co-produce various series, from Battle Fever J to Sun Vulcan. Influencing the future of its Super Sentai franchise, the first of these partnerships was the creation of a live-action series surrounding one of its most popular characters, Supaidaman, Emissary of Hell. Merely a decade after the creation of the character by Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, Spider-Man had proven to be a sensation in and out of print, previously having a live-action series done by CBS years before. Sabidamon, in that same vein, was a curious joint creation aimed at a Japanese audience, a footnote in pop culture history that would eventually be referenced in its very own source material. However, this isn't the first time Spider-Man has web-swinged overseas. In fact, seven years earlier in Monthly Shonen Magazine, a similar licensing agreement was reached between Kodansha and Marvel to produce a manga adaptation of the web wall crawler. Drawn by a young Ryoichi Ikigami, a work-for-hire artist whose style relied on semi-realism mixed with cartoonish designs, the Spider-Man manga was published from 1970 to 1971, truly evolving over the course of its run into something special. Although not nearly as popular as its far more lighthearted and cheesy contemporary, the Spider-Man manga is an odd little gem that lies somewhere between messy adaptation to Gekika manga gold. The scripts were originally done solely by Ikigami, after being provided locally translated issues by culture critic and international comic fan Kosei Ono, and for a time were pretty standard but loose in terms of adapting Spider-Man for a Japanese audience. First of all, it's not in New York City, it's the various boroughs of Tokyo. There's no Peter Parker going to a science fair and being bitten by an irradiated spider, instead it's Yukomori being bitten by a spider who got in the way of his own after-school radiation experiment. I don't know why there's a giant radiation laser in a school laboratory, and no, it never shows up again. There's no Uncle Ben and Great Power speech, just an Aunt May with an indistinct form of income and a mentally scarring first villain encounter that changes Komori's perspective forever. There's no popular Betty Brandt or blonde bombshell Gwen Stacy, instead there's the tragically overworked and criminally unloved Rumi, who suffers through a large part of the narrative. As odd of an origin as it is, Yukomori's early tales of Spider-Man are much more dark compared to Peter's. Instead of not being able to catch his uncle's killer, he accidentally kills Rumi's brother with one punch, forever learning how his own fantastical powers have dire consequences. He accidentally kills two of his early villains, Spider-Man mainstays Electro and the Lizard, both of which have personal connections to Komori outside of the mask. It adds this tragic quality to Komori's character, this growing internal struggle with not only his powers, but his own mental state and desire to do good. There are silly moments, reveals that should have been in some chapters being shown during the next, or the occasional dropped plot thread left dangling in the air, even some gags that don't hit that well. However, it's still solid work that left a rough, but albeit impactful impression on me, one that forms a foundation that Ikigami builds upon later. After the initial arcs of the series were sold and not received well by its core audience, Ikigami took measures to transition away from typical superhero fare. Enlisting the help of sci-fi novelist and manga story writer Kazumasa Hirai, Ikigami pushed the boundaries of what a Spider-Man adaptation typically meant. After the jam-packed Mysterio arc, the longest supervillain-focused arc in the series, Ikigami's Spider-Man takes a radical shift toward darker and more ethereal threats. Villains that were either more street-level and posed even more of a real-world threat, or things baked into Japanese culture such as yokai and demonic powers. From the Kendo Club arc, where Yu takes down a gaggle of Kendo Club members for the rape of a young woman, to the chilling tale of the Winter Woman and her wailing death cries. The art, that was at once cartoony but also bloody and used photographs for backgrounds, grew and changed into this photorealistic and darkly shaded, detail-oriented comic dealing with the abuse of unkept power and the struggle of maintaining peace. Yu goes through so much character development over the course of these 33 chapters, and whether that's possibly due to some chapters being lost in translation, or the constant internal monologues about his own struggle as Spider-Man, you grow to like him despite his flaws. Sure, he's a bit of a blowhard that doesn't know what he's doing at first, and it traumatizes him and the people around him. That's why he quits at one point. That Spider-Man No More moment that's synonymous with comic book covers comes to you after dealing with the chaotic kangaroo, who causes you to undergo a slight psychotic break and question whether or not he should let the city that hates him burn. It's heavy shit. It's something you wouldn't expect from a Spider-Man comic at the time, despite the eventual progression to The Night Gwen Stacy Died two years later. It was also political, strangely enough. 
I guess it's not so strange, given that the 70s were an important cultural shift for both the United States and Japan, but it really does reflect some social worries affecting the public at the time. Could they have been handled with more tact? Oh, absolutely, some of it is very heavy-handed and problematic by today's standards. Was it entertaining to read, though? A romp that truly reflects the 70s in both fashion and subtext? Yes, I think it was. Yukomori grows into a genuine Chad. I'm dead serious, he's kind of great. He plays guitar, he kicks ass outside of costume, older women love him, and he even escalates his fights to flat-out killing villains at one point, letting some die because he knows he cannot save them. He's drastically different from Peter Parker, and I love how strangely refreshing that is. And while his final arc ends in a pretty open-ended and reflective way, I can't say it was completely satisfying to see it go. It was satisfying, however, to see something progress from such a standard superhero story into a dark, introspective character drama with supernatural elements and intense action. Ikigami would later go on to illustrate a slew of classics such as 1986's Crying Freeman and the Shogakugan Award winner Heat, further proving his creative edge and general desire to push the boundaries with his work to create something both dark and beautiful. However, to say that this is the only good Spider manga is doing a disservice to a very recent gem that like its predecessor, was cancelled far too soon. I'm not talking about Spider-Man J or the manga vs. Spider-Clan books, though unique and interesting in their own ways. I'm talking about the mobile app Manga Pocket's more recent collaboration with Marvel in 2019. Although not the only notable book to come out of a recent push in Japan by Marvel Entertainment, Yusuke Osawa's Spider-Man Fake Red is a stellar Spider-Man story that luckily got some form of conclusion. Only around 14 chapters or so, we don't focus on a completely new protagonist in a completely Japanese setting. Instead, we're smack dab in the middle of Marvel's New York City, populated with superheroes and supervillains alike. Our protagonist this time around is far more relatable than the social outcast Yukomori. Instead, Yu Onomae is a fairly typical but lonely teenager just trying to get by while struggling in school. There's some small subtext suggesting he's native Japanese and his transition to his current high school is much harder than where he was at home. But that might just be an inference done because the scanlation keeps a huge Twitter in Japanese. I digress. Yu miraculously finds Peter Parker's spider suit in the middle of an alley and, without knowing if it's the real thing or not and where Spider-Man really is, takes it for himself. While Peter is effectively MIA for at least half of its short run, Yu must take Spider-Man's place and become the hero the city of New York needs, all while resident Dan Slot creation Silk picks up the slack while searching for the missing hero. I won't spoil the whole story because it's so short, but it's really charming and much more lighthearted than the 70s version. It takes the moral you've heard time and time again about anyone can be Spider-Man, and thrusts our everyman superfan protagonists into the position where they really need to learn what it means to be Spider-Man. Needless to say, I really wish this could have become an ongoing despite its short run. It could have benefited from a long-running storyline where Peter didn't come back immediately, forcing you into the position where he has to act as Spider-Man more frequently, as Silk acts as some sort of a pseudo-mentor. It inhabits the spirit of Spider-Man, the struggle between two worlds and keeping up a lie that can almost get you killed. It even has its own with great power moment, and it resonates. Regardless, both Osawa's writing and incredibly dynamic artwork knocked this sucker out of the park, and it's a shame that it didn't sell well enough within Japan for it to warrant a second volume. Osawa's a newer mangaka, only releasing work within this past decade to major publications, but his talent, at least as an artist, is very clear, and I can't wait to see what he tackles next. So, to wrap it back around to Spidamon once again, the emissary from hell and pilot of the mecha Leopardon, these stories are interesting and somewhat iconic in their interpretations of the same character. Yukomori and even Yu Onomae are considered canon Marvel characters, Komori even referenced in the original Spider-Verse event at least by name, though not nearly as recognized with the same acclaim as many, many manga from the 70s such as Osama Tezuka's catalog or Go Nagai's, I'd like to believe that people should give both the 70s Spider-Man manga a chance as well as seek out the translations for Spider-Man Fake Red. Both are thoroughly enjoyable in their own ways, and really encapsulate at least one core element of what makes the original print run of Spider-Man, from Lee to DiMatteis, so special. It's not about the costume at the end of the day, or the cool villain Spider-Man has to fight, or even the powers. It's about the struggle of one young man, the life they live, and the heavy responsibility they carry, all for the greater good. Thank you for watching.